Get me live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to the shop. Today we are continuing with the joinery window and we are actually going to be doing the drawboard tenon, which is one of my all-time favorite joints. Um, it's just, it's a very functional, very cool joint that is, well, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, so uh, we do have a few things that have been going on in the shop that I wanted to, to show you. Uh, we have a, well, for those of you who are patrons or members, you may have been on the live this morning because we were doing a bunch of work and so occasionally I turn the camera on so people can just see what's happening in the shop. Um, and so we were making a clock with my daughter. Um, I'm starting on the next furniture project actually, which is, whoop, right down here. Uh, and this is actually going to be a set of shelves that go on the desk. And uh, one of the items is uh, bending an arch for it. And so I've got that in it, but that will actually go on the, uh, the desk over there. Doesn't that shop look just totally a mess? But there's a really gorgeous woman over there. So mm -hmm. why don't you talk mm -hmm. about your bench? Because you did something on that today. I did. Make sure the microphone doesn't fall. So, let's see. So we uh, chamfered the edges and we uh, flush cut the, the drawboard tenons that we did. And then we, let's see if I can do this. <laughs> might lose a toe in the process. We put the dowels through. So, ooh, I even got back on. So now it's sturdy. Um, so we just need to finish the top and put holes in for dog holes. And yeah, so it's coming yeah. along. So hopefully, well, we've got one more video Oh, we did on another it. finishing, yeah. Um, so all of the legs and all the details on that is done. Yes. Um, we have to flatten the top, do the final on that, um, dog holes, and uh, finish, and it will be done. So hopefully that video will be coming out in the next uh, couple weeks. Oh, only um, like a year in the making. <laughs> yeah. So, <something> like <laughs> so it's coming along. Uh, so we'll be working on a. Yeah, I was actually working with these, the shelves. This is um, this is five quarter white oak, um, fourteen inch wide stock. And I had a board nine foot long that we're cutting down to make the shelves for it. Uh, so this is really nice stuff. But one of them will have um, butterfly key in it, and it'll be really kind of cool. Slightly different joinery um, with an arch support on the, the bottom. So for those of you in the hive mind, who I put up a picture of that about a week or so ago with some ideas of that. So lots of fun things coming up in the shop. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, and this. This should be kind of interesting. Um, a lot of people will look at this and think that it's absolutely out of focus, as it is. Uh, this is a, a, a fairly early um, a Bailey um, Stanley, and it is in absolute mess. Um, just, yeah, it's a mess. So we're going to have some fun with restoring that. Um, and this, it sounds like it's actually going to be a collab. Uh, with a couple other channels doing some really cool things with it. So stay tuned for that. Um, so yeah, let's actually get into what we've been doing. So let me look at the, this is a, a window that has nine different joints from six different boards. And each joint is di very different. And the interesting thing about this is it's very difficult to get everything to go together. Uh, you have to actually uh, get everything exact, everything made just perfect. Um, otherwise, there's going to be small imperfections here and there that add up, and when you finally get to that last joint, it just doesn't want to close quite right. Um, and so this is the one that I made uh, about two years ago now, um, and it's got all the joints in there, but you can see the last joint didn't quite come together as perfect because there were slight imperfections. And you look at any one individual joint, and they're all really nice, um, but slowly they don't quite add up. And so we're going to do it again. <laughs> um, the last time we did the mortise and tenon, which is a fairly similar joint, sim similar, simple joint. Um, today we're going to do the drawboard tenon. Um, and this is actually going to be a through tenon. The last one was only an inch long, so it didn't go all the way through into the other board. Uh, this one will. So we are going to actually, making sure I get the right boards on here, I got this one and this one. Um, it's going to go in there. Now I went ahead and made the tenon because I've done that like three other times on this. We had the tenon last time, we've done the, the half lap, we've done the uh, uh, bridle joint. Um, so you've seen how to make tenons. I'm not going to, to do that because this is gonna take a little more time. The interesting thing on this is we want this to go all the way through. 
So we want a hole on both sides of the board that are in the exact right place so that when the tenon comes through, we have a nice tight hole on the opening here. And then on top of that, we're going to put a pin through the whole thing. But the pin isn't just a pin going through, it's actually offset ever so slightly that will suck the board in tighter into the joint. Now that pin actually won't go through um, until we finish all the joints when we actually go and assemble the thing. Uh, but we'll be working through that and I'll talk through some of the, uh, the pins for it. So uh, before we jump into this, any particular questions? Mm -mm. Cool. Uh, so if anyone does have any questions, throw those in the chat. If you are watching live, uh, well, you see the questions as they come in. There's my square. Um, if you are watching this recorded, then down below in the, the description, I have timestamps for everything so you can read through all the questions and see what, as well as the timeline itself will be spaced out with where the questions are. So first thing we want to do is this board is going to go into this board. And this is actually in the middle of the window. So we need to figure out where in this board is it going to go. And it really doesn't matter because I haven't done any of the other joints. So if I wanted to, I could put this board up at the top and make it, you know, like that. Uh, but I want to actually put it in the middle because middles look pretty, right? <laughs> so I need to find the center of this board to put all this in. And a lot of this comes down to the, the marking and the, the layout. The, the better your layout is, the better all of your joinery is going to be. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's grab this, let's grab that. And I, mean, I showed it one way last time. This time I'm actually going to use a uh, ruler on here. So this whole board is longer than my ruler. So I'm actually going to make a mark here at the 12. And I'm going to put this on here. And it is right on 15 inches, which is what it should have been. So I know that the center of this board uh, is then going to be at 17 and a half inches. So I'm actually going to put a mark at 17 and a half. And then the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put this over here and just the guarantee that yes, indeed, I'm at seven and a half. So that mark is the center of my board. Now, my tenon that I made, I did not measure a specific width to this tenon. I just cut off a little bit on either side to give that shoulder all the way around. So this tenon is two and a sixteenth ish. Two and about 16th actually. So we're going to put this on here and I'm going to roughly lay out some marks on here to get an idea about where I want it. This is, doesn't have to be exact yet but this will allow me to see, to see pretty close to where it is. So I'm actually going to put it onto the 2 here so I have it sticking off. So half of 2 and a 16th is 2, is 1, and a 32nd. So I'm going to put a mark right there. I'm going to come up this way, 1 and a 32nd, put a mark there. And theoretically, if I put this on there, I should be able to put it into those two marks. And it's a little bit less than that. Not by much, but a little bit. So, what I'm going to have, is I'm going to split that distance. Diff actually, it's like a 64th less than that. So there's the center of the board. And because it really doesn't matter, I'm just going to set it right there. And I'm going to put a little nick mark on here on the shoulder. Not on the tenon, just on the shoulder. Do the same thing over here. Because I want to know where this board goes in width-wise. So I have this mark here on the edge. And this is the most important mark on this whole thing. Because this mark will eventually get transferred over to this board and this board, where this board will then intersect with those. So now that I've made these marks on here, everything else is going to be based off those marks. And that's why I said it really doesn't matter where it is on this board this can intersect up here or down here. Wherever I make those marks is what's going to matter. And that's pretty close to center. So now the next thing we need to do is we need to, actually I'm going to carry these marks up onto the face of this board. I'm not going to mark it very heavy, just light. And I'm going to bring it over to this one. Just a light cut right there. And those are going to allow me to then mark off where this tenon is. So I'm going to find something to lift up the other end of this. Hey, there we go. My Kumiko jig. <laughs> you didn't see that video that came out on Saturday. And so this will allow me to support it. And I'm going to line up the board with those marks. Make sure we're in focus. So. 
I've got my mark here, and that's right on the edge of the board, and I've got my mark here, and that's right on the edge of the board. Now I'm going to mark here in the middle where that tenon intersects. So I'm going to mark either side of that tenon. Whoop! It slid. Put my knife back into that line, slide the tenon up against it, tighten that all up, make the mark on the other side. It's one of the things I like about lives. You get to see the reality of what it actually looks like. So now I have a mark at this end and a mark at this end of where exactly that tenon is going to end up. And so, you're probably not going to see it, but mark and mark. Now we need to know the width of that. So what I've done is I still have this marking gauge set up from last week when we made the tenon. And it's the exact same marks that I had for laying out the tenon here. So all I need to do is use, use this to play connect the dots between those two lines. Again, the side with the tape is my reference face, and that's the side that goes up against the fence on this. Any questions so far? Mm -mm. No questions? Well, we do. Okay, they're oh. not related necessarily to the project. Ah, okay. Well, I'll get to those a little later. So now I can mark out this. And this so far is pretty straightforward. This is just like any other tenon, uh, or just like any other mortise. I'm just laying out the two ends and where it all comes around. The question then comes is how do I put this exact mark on the other side of the board to know that it's in the exact same place. So when this tenon slides through, it comes out the other side. And the trick to that is just simple little nicks. So I'm going to put this into that stop mark, slide this over, and I'm going to put a little nick in the corner. Same thing on the other side. A little nick in the corner. I'm going to roll this over. Put my knife into that little nick that I just made. Slide the square up against it. Put a little nick on this corner here. Put my knife into this nick. Slide the square up to it. Transfer that nick over here. And now we can bring this up. Put my knife into the nick. And make my mark here. And that's my mark on the face. Same thing over here. And as long as my board is square, these nicks, these marks, will be exactly parallel to where they are on the other, face, the other side. The only other thing I need to do is mark the two faces. So I'll come into this, and I can mark across. Now, at this point, it's just a mortise. And I can treat it like any other, but I'm going to try something a little different today. Um, because I had several questions slash complaints slash why don't you try doing it this way? Well, I have tried doing it this way, but I'm going to show you a different method because last time we just took a chisel and chiseled it out. And I'm going to do some of that, um, but I want to actually bore it out. So this channel suddenly got very, very boring. Now here's the problem. I have a quarter inch bit here that needs to go straight through that board. So if I do this or this, then we start to have problems. Or worse yet, if I do it this way or this way, we have problems. And so the way you fix that is you only go halfway into the board. And then you come around and you come halfway from the other side. So that means drilling you know, five holes this side, five holes this side, and they each come halfway. So inside, in the middle, it's out. And that's really not a problem because the only thing that matters is the opening here and the opening here that need to be exact. So I'm going to put this into my vise, hang it up vertical, Make sure you put your ring on, and that will allow it to balance out. So let's actually bring this over. And I'm going to be drilling quite a few holes here, so it'd be a good time for questions. Oh, of... so you're going to put the ring on it? <laughs> yes. If you like it. Um, do you think you're on the other camera? Am I? Oh, let me do this one. There you go. And so the ring lets me know if I am vertical, if I'm uh, level. And you can steer it when it's first getting ready to get it in there. And because the ring rotates, it'll actually slide along as I go up and down. It's not actually like gravity pulling it down, sliding on the shaft. It's actually because it's rotating. So you need it to rotate to okay. be able to tell you what it's doing. Is there a button I can hit to focus it? What's that? Here. Is that better? Oh, that's a lot better. Okay, thank you.
And that's far enough for that one. Should probably put a piece of tape on this so I know how far to go. But I'm just eyeballing because it really doesn't matter too much. What questions we got while I'm working on this? Um, so off topic question, if you're okay with that. Yeah. Brock Hughes wants to know, have you ever worked with sycamore wood? I have never worked with sycamore wood. So sorry, no. Um, there are far more woods out there that I've not worked with than the ones that I have worked with. Um, I actually don't know too much about sycamore. I um, haven't actually researched it, so yeah, it'd be an interesting one to play with. Except it's in the Pocahontas song. <laughs> Colors of the wind, that's all I know. <laughs> so that one. And this is one of the reasons why I generally don't bore the holes in a mortise because this is boring. <laughs> And in a lot of cases, boring is boring. I'd rather just the, the impact and the fun of it. What's another question? Um, I got two more on this side. I have any uh, right now. What's that? We got some peeps that haven't been around lately and they came by to say hi. So thanks, guys. Um, Tommy's making a bench out of poplar too with a white oak vice chop seat. So he says it's basically the wood by right tribute bench. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that volunteer's tribute. The Sarah wannabe bench. <laughs> well, everyone wants to be like, Sarah, come on. On these ones, I don't care if I'm particularly level because they're the ones in the middle. It's the one on the very top and bottom that matter. So now... We've got those holes. Now we can turn it around and we can come at it from the other side. Yay! <laughs> um, there were a couple questions that were asked really early on. Did you get a chance to write those down? I didn't because you answered them in the chat. Oh, I thought those might be good ones for. But I sure can try to find them again. Okay, one was from Alex. Oh, let's see, what did Alex? Where would be the best place to look for design ideas, guides, plans for tables and table legs? Uh, you know, the, when I'm designing something and I'm trying to figure out what I want it to look like, my, gen, my biggest go-to is Google, picture, Google image search. Um, I use that all the time. A lot of people really like going to uh, Pinterest. It's just not my thing. Love Pinterest. <laughs> it is Sarah's thing. I can spend way too much time on that. <laughs> Here, I want to see something. Very good. Don't want to go too far. But I want to go far enough. The other thing I don't like about boring it out, and you'll probably end up seeing that on this, is that you occasionally get spots where you go off the side a little ways and you start cutting into your, your knife line. And it's just a little bit more annoying okay. that way. Now I'm getting some questions. Oh, okay. What do we got? So let's see. Um, SJ LaRue asked, can you show how the ring shows it is straight? Yeah, actually, let me get a good hole started here. Having a little bit of problem with the grain wanting to move this over. There we go. So once I get it in here, show this. Now I have the, there's a smooth section of shaft right here. And what you'll see is it, I'm gonna go down first. I'm gonna lower my end. And see right now it has enough gravity to slide, but I don't wanna, I wanna know a little bit here. So I'm gonna be drilling straight and level. And then I go down and you'll see the ring slide towards the end like that. And then if I go up, you'll see the ring slide Oop. Got to get it onto the actual round shaft. When I go up, you'll see it slide to the other end. That lets me know that I need to lower to get it back down here, except for it popped off. I let it go too far. And so then the ring, got to go a little lower. Let's me make sure I am right on. And so you're kind of chasing it back and forth like this. But in this case, it really doesn't matter. Because I'm in the middle, so if I go a little up or down, a little dance. Oh well. <laughs> I what was just imagining um, 
Oh, don't want that hole. What's his face from Lord of the Rings? What's his face from Lord of oh. the Rings? That's very specific. Hey, shush. I'm disappointing all my Legolas? fellow nerds. Huh? Legolas? Why did you default to Legolas? No, the one who made the ring. Oh, Sauron? Sauron. I couldn't think of that. I was just imagining Sauron doing his woodworking hobby with the ring to rule them all. <laughs> <laughs> and it got so much speed and it starts to light up anyways. I'm a dork. I know. It's okay. When you put it on the, uh, the auger shaft, it, words appear. <laughs> In an old elven tongue. <laughs> Everyone else is guessing other people. <laughs> that dude from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yes. There's a few of them. Thank you to all our subscribers, by the way. What's that? Uh, we've had like four new subscribers, so I was well, saying thank, thank you. you. So what other questions we got? My impressions. <laughs> uh, let's see. I got one more hole. Tommy Roberts one. wants to know how the ring trials are coming. Um, good. Yeah, I'm actually testing a whole bunch of different rings, washers, and so on, uh, which is kind of fun to see what characteristics actually give you the most accurate measurement. And out of all of them that I've tried, my wedding band is by far the most accurate. My wife does good work. Had I known, actually, maybe I did know, maybe I knew I, when I bought it, it had to have weight to it, because I knew he'd care about that. Well, that's, that's one of the things I'm finding that doesn't really matter, is the weight. It has to do with the, the, the shaft. You want it rounded on the inside, but not so much. Not like a thin key ring or a washer. Well, what is, it's com was it comfort fit? Comfort fit, but comfort you don't want fit. it flat on the inside. You want it to be able to twist a little bit, but not too much. And getting that right balance is, is hard to find. <laughs> but. Troy said Sauron is a real woodworker. He's missing a finger. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really good meme there. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> so let's grab. Wait, does that make you Lord of the Rings right now? <laughs> Better than Lord of the Dance. <laughs> let's grab some chisels. So I have my regular quarter inch. My mallets go. Your mallets are over, were over here. We oh, that's start. right. You were using them today. Uh, here we go, guys. My wife's already stealing my tools. Yes, I stole them. <laughs> They're still in the shop. So I'm going to be using a mortise chisel to begin with because I've got one. Um, that's what I made the, the, the measurements off of. Um, but in all honesty, a bench chisel just, just, as, just as well for this, especially with removing the waste. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why on small things like this, I generally don't... Um, I generally don't bore out because I'm still going to have to come back and clean it up. Now it's going to be a little faster to do it this way, but it's not going to be a huge amount more. Um, not going to be a huge amount faster. I mean, it's, the, the chopping out is going to be faster. The whole process, I don't know if it'll be that much faster. The nice thing about this is I'm getting getting a little spot here, and rather than chopping down like I normally would, I'm actually going to put it at an angle. Kind of like a plow plane and clean out this way. Chip out along there. Actually, I'm going to define those a little bit more first. So I'm going to grab a regular bench plane. So I chipped out a little bit too far. Oop. I want to be very careful not to split the wood. It's very easy to use this chisel as a wedge and just drive it in there. The nice thing about this is if it's not perfect on one side, it's okay because it gets covered. But the other side, it has to be perfect because it can be seen. Okay, do you think you're on the other camera? Oh, look at that, I'm not. There, is that better? Now you can actually see coming in from the other side. So. Now we're going to get close to this end grain line, not quite on it, drive it in, and I'm still away about a sixteenth of an inch, 
do the same thing on this end, staying away about 16th of an inch. And let's come in and clean out all those chips. Now, before we go any farther, bring the tenon over here and make sure I've got the right width. Oop. Actually, it's a bit fat. So is this on the inside or is this the one that's showing? Oh, no! Did you do the wrong way? It's on the outside. So yeah, I'm going to have some gap here now. I thought I was working on the inside, so I was being a little more sloppy. Such is life. Oh, well. That's why we do things live here. So I'm going to continue down, pare down the sides. And so now that it's developed, I can be a little more aggressive with it. And then I can come in here and pare that out again. And it's going to be rinse and repeat the whole way down. Actually, rather than using that one to clean out, to pair out, I'm going to use this. Because this is the right width. And with this, I can actually lever stuff out because it has some mass to it. And that's why I left that sixteenth of an inch on either end, so I can lever against that sixteenth of an inch. If I went right in that line, anytime I'm levering against that, I'm just going to be pushing that line farther back. So let's actually come in here. So does that make it a weapon of mass destruction? Uh, I love you, babe. Of course you do. Come in at either end. And then pair down either side. And then clean the chips out. Second verse, same as the first. Ought to get better, but it's not. <laughs> hey, at least it isn't boring anymore. What other questions we have? Let's see, Journey North asked, I need a new mortise marking gauge. Do you prefer a new disc style or old scratcher style? You know, the one I use the most, more than anything else, is this one. I really like pins. Uh, for going with the grain, pins are my preferred. And this one actually comes from Harbor Freight. Um, and I really like it, I, I do. Um, I've got the, the Veritas twin wheel. I don't like using this as much. Um, I, I'm not a huge fan of wheels when going with the grain. A lot of people really, really like them, but when going with the grain, this isn't a huge fan. When you're mortise marking, you're going with the grain. So rarely do I have the second one extended. I'm generally just using the first one. But that's just personal preference. So, Yeah, uh, surprisingly, that's the one I use. It's the one from Harbor Freight. I've got a couple old ones uh, that I use occasionally, but the one I grab more than any other is the one from Harbor Freight. Okay. So we're down about halfway. Actually, I think we're a little shy of halfway. Yeah, we're down about a third of the way. So I'm going to flip it over and do the same thing from the other side. And I'm going to take my time on this side and show you what it looks like a little bit cleaner. So there's the line. I'm actually going to move away from the line a little ways. Just the 16th end of the middle. Drive down in. Come away from the line a little ways. The same thing on this side. This side I drilled one more hole than the other side. So this side actually cleans out a little bit better. And then I'm going to grab my chisel. I'm going to come in about a sixteenth inch away from the end. Not on that end line. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Same thing on this end. And then we can pair out. Actually, I can't do that yet because I haven't gone back to the line. The chisel's a little wider. So now I'm going to go right into that line. Right into the line. Keep the chisel vertical. And I'm just eyeballing vertical. I'm not worrying about it being perfect. Because if I undercut a little bit, that's okay. If I overcut a little bit, then that's not a problem either. I can come back and clean it up in the future. There's one side. Now let's come in and grab the other side. Of 
This is a uh, this is a one inch, yeah, one inch bench chisel from Nerex. If you haven't seen my videos on my chisel test, it's uh, the Nerex Richters are amazing. I absolutely love those things. Just got asked like yesterday, the day before, do you still like them? It's like, yeah, they are my favorites by far. All right, let's check our width. Now that we've gotten this close. Yeah, see, that one's a lot better. That's the width I'm looking for right there. So this side won't have gaps, but this is the side that gets covered with the shoulder. Such is life. So we're going to continue it. So same thing. Pound down, clean out the sides, come back in with the chisel, and remove the waste. Also, now that I'm a third of the way through on the other side, probably a little over a third of the way through on this side, on my next one, I'm just going to pound through because I'm not going to worry about it catching on anything. I just want to get all of this junk out of here. What other questions we have while we're cleaning this out? Let's see. So from earlier, Fly Fish and Chief had asked, James, do you make the draw bore pegs? And if so, what wood would you recommend? Um, most of the time, I just use dowel stock. Um, but every now and then, I'll want the peg to match, and so I'll make my own. Hey, look there. Now we can just drive it straight through. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Dowel stock, you want something that is resilient and um, grain strong. So hickory, oak, ash, they make really good dowels. Um, I am using oak because I've got oak and I love oak. And why not? Besides, we're all the knights of the white oak, so. Okay, now I've gotten a hole that goes all the way through. So the chisel can go all the way down in. There's still a good bit of junk in there to clean up, but we'll get that in a little bit. Now what I want to do is I want to go all the way to the lines on either end. So in this case, I'm going to go halfway. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to go halfway. It's really close. So I'm going to put it right into that line. I'm going to go about halfway, about halfway if I can. I'm going to establish the chisel so it's in good place. I'm going to eyeball that it's vertical. And I'm going to run down about halfway. So if it's skewed off the side just a little bit. There we go. And then do the same thing on the other side. Eyeball it's vertical in both directions. Now, let's check it lengthwise. Yeah, see, that's what I'm looking for right there. Cool. So let's flip that over. Do the same thing from the other end. On this one, I can go halfway back to the line. Come free. And now we can go right into the line. Got something stuck down in there. So I'm use this to pare it out. There we go. Do the same thing on the other end. What's the next question? Let's see. James Lettner asked which boards aren't good for this project and which boards are the best? Uh, there really is no best. Um, for this kind of project where you're just doing joinery, whatever you have on hand. Um, if you make it out of pine, um, it'll be much easier for the most part, but you won't learn a whole lot. Pine is not a great learning wood because it's just a bit too easy in a lot of cases. However, um, the one thing with pine is your tools have to be crazy sharp. Pine has to have really sharp tools or you're just going to be crushing the wood. Um, 
Poplar is a really nice, easy wood. Oak is a very, very hard wood. Not hard as in um, dense as it is, but it is a very difficult wood because of the grain. So what I'm doing now is I'm actually paring down the sides, looking for any junk that's sticking out that will cause the tenon to stop because I want to be able to slide this through. And I want to be able to slide my mortising chisel from end to end. And once I can slide it from end to end of the slot, now I'm going to put it, here, let me actually lift it up so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to put it in so that it's touching this edge over here. And then I'm going to tip it back and see I'm not touching the edge on this side. So that means there's a lump in the middle that's allowing this to seesaw. That's about what I was expecting because I haven't cleaned that up that far yet. Do the same thing from the other side. There it goes. And this side I even have a slightly bigger lump. So that is what we need to clean out. I want to look in there and see if I can see the lump. And I can't quite see the lump. They meet from the other side. So that means there's actually a bit of a, a cone. They're, they're cut in like this. So I need to actually cut in from both sides. A lot of times you'll have like one little thing sticking out and you need to clean that off. But this time I need to actually trim from both sides to meet. And that's pretty common. I'm actually going to use a regular bench chisel for this um, just because it's a little sharper. I've um, chipped that, not chipped, just dulled it. I haven't sharpened that one in a while. And when you're cutting the end grain, you want something really, really sharp. And this is actually pretty sharp at the but moment. But don't bend it up, because that's bad. <laughs> in this case, I'm actually going to undercut it just a little bit. Yeah. And cut back in. Cut in about halfway. Come over to this side, because we need to do the same thing on both sides. No. But what I'm saying is, unlike a mortar machine, Yeah, you don't want to lever it. Don't lever it. Yeah. Bad. Then you're not allowed to touch the chisel. <laughs> <laughs> and I can use this to just clean up, make sure that it will go all the way in. Okay, there we go. I'm gonna flip it over and do the same thing from the other side. And then we'll check it again. What other questions we got? Sudden Rain asks, advice which mortise chisel to buy at the beginning. I want to take a 6 and 12 meter, 12 millimeter as the most versatile. Is this a good choice? Which would be? Honestly, I, I generally suggest don't buy mortise chisels. Um, when you're first getting off, don't buy mortise chisels. Bench chisels will do it just fine. They'll do it perfectly. The only thing is just the levering. You want to be a little more careful with that. Uh, but they'll do, they'll do it all just fine. Um, and save your money for other things. This is, a, this is a specialty tool. This makes things easier, but it doesn't make things better. Um, so it, it's not something, if, if, if you've got a limited amount of tool and you've got other things to buy, buy other things. However, if you've gotten to the point where, yeah, you're ready to, and you want to get something a little better, or you got the money, um, usually, if you want to buy new, sorry, it's right next to my microphone. It's probably pretty loud. If you want to buy new, I like Narex. Um, they're not the best on the market. However, for the money, they are incredibly good for the quality you get. And so the, I wish they made Narex Richters, but they don't. <laughs> but yeah, the Narex are, are great. The other thing I'm going to say is don't buy a set, just buy what you need. Uh, it's very rare that you find someone who bought a set like, yeah, I've actually used them all. Um, usually one or two that you do. And as to size, it really depends. I use my quarter inch more than anything. Um, a lot of people really like the three eighths, but it really comes down to what you're going to be working with. If you're working with a lot of three quarter inch stock, you want a tenon that is usually one third or ever so slightly larger than one third. Um, so let's check it again. So we're going to put it on this edge, lay it down. There, we're touching both edges. So let's flip this back over. So once I have the chisel in there, I'm touching the edge here and I'm touching the edge there. That lets me know it might be undercut here just a little bit. 
um, but I've got a nice clean. The, chisel, the, the tenon can go all the way across in there. So let's check it on this side. And we're touching the edge here, touching the edge there. Oh, we still have a bit of a lump here. So I gotta clean up this side a little bit. Let me look down in there. Oh yeah, I see where it's at. This just has a bit of junk that's sticking out into it. So this one will be a little bit easier to clean out. What other questions we got? So they're slightly off topic questions. Cool. Uh, Woodwork Learner asks, just got a cheap number seven plane, but the cap iron or chip breaker seems to be five millimeters too short. Have you ever come across this before? Five millimeters too short. I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, are you meaning that you, it's five millimeters away from the tip when the iron just sticks out? Um, in which case then that's not the original chip breaker and it is meant it's the wrong one. Um, not a huge issue, uh, especially for something big like that. Um, you don't need a jointer plane to have a really tight chip breaker. Um, five millimeters back is perfectly fine. Do I still have a lump in there? I still have a lump in there. Where is it? Oh, it's on this side. Okay. A little more work. What time is it? 41. Uh, we're okay. So let's go back at this. This is one of the reasons why I like doing lives. You get to see the reality because if it's a video, uh, you just don't have time to show all this. But with a live, you can see it all. Just go ahead and undercut that a good bit. Make sure it'll work. There we go. Try it one more time. <laughs> Try it three more times. So there. Ah! There's <laughs> still not touching. So let me just make sure and double check. Make sure it's not just riding on something on the side. Oh, it's just riding on something on the side. Okay. Right, yep, there's a little bit of junk on the side. This is one of those things you just got to work at it and put the tools in there and make sure that they touch both edges. But this time I just had a little bit of junk sticking out on the side that the chisel was catching on. So I'm going to come in and clean it out. I wish I could make the wood clear so you could actually see what's happening inside because there's no way I can get a camera to see what's happening down in there. At least not without a lot of money and equipment. There you go. Now we have a good joint that goes all the way across. So, moment of truth. Now, when, I, when I'm doing this with the draw bore, I actually want this to be a little bit more loose than I get with others. And the reason for that is we have to put it together and pull it apart and put it together and pull it apart. Um, so, when I do that, I just want to make sure that I can get it apart. Yeah, that's right about what I want. Don't have to have a mallet. But it goes right down in. And I'm going to have some gaps on this one because I uh, thought I was on the wrong side. So here you can see. Really nice joint shoulder on this one. I like that. But of course on the outside, <laughs> there are big gaps. <laughs> but it's really, it's tight and solid. That's, that's, it, it's not working, uh, not wiggling. I just, uh, I was assuming this was the shoulder side. So let me actually flip this around. Here. To take it apart, open up your vise so it'll hang down in between the two jaws, and then just pull it out like that. So I'm actually going to flip it around and see how tight the other side is. Theoretically, it should go either direction. Ah, oh, so you know that side's nice. Well, that side does have a little bit of gap at the end. That side's a lot better. Not perfect, but a lot better. So, all right, now we get into the actual draw bore. So we've got that together, and you can always glue that. But how do you do this without glue? And this is one of the things I really like, is we're gonna take it apart, and we're gonna drill a hole through this. And it really doesn't matter where, usually in the middle of whatever the, 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 the hole, the, the tenon is. And so I'm just gonna eyeball where it is, because it doesn't really matter. Nothing really matters. Oh dear. 
Okay, now find the right bit. We're going to put a half inch dowel in there. Why a half inch dowel? Because, because I have, have a half inch dowel. And I am going to eyeball center of center. Um, do you want to switch cameras? Oh, uh, not yet. Okay. I'm just eyeballing where it is on the board. Something around there. Lift this up. Turn it over. Focus it a bit. And we are going to bore through from this side. Now I'm going to blow out onto the middle, into the middle of this board. And that's okay. It's not ideal, but there's nothing you can do about it because you can't come to the other side. So I'm going to have to clean that out. And now I want to go until I can just see the tip coming out on this side. Stop. Back it out because I want a clean hole on both sides. Turn this around. And now I can put it right into that dimple that popped out. And clean that out. Now, because it blew out into the inside, we've got chips in there we need to clean out. I'll grab the chisel, just pare those out. Just like that. Now we can put this, make sure this one goes there, this one goes there, goes in like that. Put it back together. Just like that, make sure we're good and tight all the way around. And then I'm going to take the bit that we just used, put it in that hole, I'm going to center it where it needs to be, I'm just going to push it in just a little bit. Just push it into the wood, pull it out. Make sure I actually dimple that, I'm going to make that dimple a little bit heavier, just so I can see it easier. There, that way I know where the middle of that hole is. One more time, we're going to take it apart. One of the reasons why you want that to be a little bit loose. And now, what I'm going to do is the, this is the point at which the drawbore tenon, this is, this is the most important step of everything. This is life, the universe, everything, right here. <laughs> um, we're going to grab my awl. We're going to find that dimple right there. And what I want to do is I, want to, I don't want to drill right there because I don't want that hole to be perfectly in line. I'm going to move it towards the shoulder. In this case, because it's good hardwood, a little bit more than a sixteenth, not quite an eighth. And I'm going to put a new hole right there. I'm going to make this a good, heavy hole. We're going to put this in the vise, and we're going to re-drill that. So I've got that hole right there. Ooh, here's one step. Because this is thin wood, there's a chance when I drill that, this is going to split. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to grab a vise really quickly. Put that on here. Just hold that together so if it does want to split, this will keep it from splitting. And now we can drill. And I'm going to stop there, because I want to have a nice clean hole on both sides of this one. Turn it around. Drill from the other side. Just like that. So now, I've got a hole on here that won't perfectly line up with this one. It'll be off just a little bit. Put it back together and just see how far off. Should be by about a sixteenth or a little less. There we go. And there we go. Let me see if I can actually zoom in and show you that. On focus, there we go. So you can see it looks really closely lined up, except for you can see a little bit more coming out on that side. And on the other side, it kind of dips back in. And so what's going to happen is when I drive that dowel in there, when I drive the dowel into the hole, it's actually going to pull this board in 
because the hole from this, the hole on this board is moved over this way just a little bit. So it will try and make those holes line up. That will suck this shoulder really, really, really tight against that joint. And then in that case, there's a pin holding it so this can't come out. And that pin is being held in because the joint is out of alignment and so it's being pinched in place. So that's a dowel. The only way you're going to get this apart is to drill out that dowel and destroy it. You're never going to be able to push that dowel back out. And that makes it an incredibly strong, incredibly um, functional joint that needs no glue at all. I mean, you see this on a lot of antique uh, furniture and the, the dowels will be inside and hidden, um, but it is a very, very strong way of doing it. Um, now, the other thing is the dowel. In this case, I'm just using an oak dowel, um, but if you get a, a dowel box or dowel plate, which I have several videos, I have one in making this one, um, you can make your own dowel to fit some, find something that fits to it. As to the wood, really doesn't matter. Nothing soft. Um, because you don't want it to absolutely crush. You want to actually pull those together. Something stiff, something that will take that twisting force. Hickory oak are making great dowels. Maple would be great. Pretty much any decent hardwood would make a good dowel for it. Um, the other thing you want to do is you want to leave the dowel long. So it only needs to be three quarter inch long to go through this. But I'm going to use this whole thing. And I'm going to chamfer one end so that it goes in a little bit easier. And so I'm just going to grab a block plane and chamfer it up. And with it like this, that'll give it a bit of a bull nose. So when it goes past that step, it will go through it a lot easier. We were having fun doing this today. <laughs> there. So just like that. It doesn't need to be anything amazing. Just a little bit. Focus. Come on, focus. Did I focus? I can't tell. Ah, uh, yeah, it looks pretty focused. Okay, so it's just like that. Nothing, nothing special. But when that goes through, it'll ride past the hole a little bit. And so in the end, this will stick out a half inch on one side, and then I can take the other side and I can just flush cut it off, and then flush cut off that. And so if it's longer than it needs to be, it just makes it a lot easier for driving it in, rather than just making it the right size and hoping for the best. So there is a drawboard tenon, um, one of my all-time favorites. So what questions do we have? You're not going to finish it? No, I can't put it together um, because I need to do the rest of the joints. So oh. this doesn't actually go in until the final glue up. Otherwise, <laughs> I can't get these apart. Excuse me. And I have to do true. all the other joints in this. Uh, so I still have a joint here, a joint here, and a joint here to do. Um, so all three of the joints left are in these two pieces. <laughs> but when we do the final glue up, and that's always a fun one, the, on the, the last day, um, we will do the glue up of the whole thing. And so I get to do a really stressful glue up live. So come along for the fun. What do we got? So Michael C. wants to know, could you bore out the hole first before cutting the mortise? Um, sure, you could. Um, don't think it would make any difference one way or the other. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, the, the problem that people see is when you blow out on the inside, you lose a few chips on the inside. Um, but because this is a joint that's designed to work without glue, it doesn't change the strength or integrity of it. And those are fibers that end on either side of the hole, so those don't add any structural strength to it. Uh, so I don't, I don't think it would make any difference one way or the other. So if you want to drill it beforehand, go for it. Good question. I never thought about that before. What's next? Um, that was a 53. Okay. Let's see. Uh, Peter Wall wants to know, how would you set a saw without a saw set? Um, a, uh, a, a nail and a hammer, or even just a small hammer. Um, the easiest way to do it is to set the plate on its side. So you take your saw. Of course, I grab the one that's pinned in. Take your saw and put it on some soft piece of wood, some pine or something like that. And then every other tooth, come in, put a nail on it, and give it a tap. Put the next one, a tap. And you just want to use the same amount of force on every single one. And then you turn the saw over and you do every other tooth in between going the other direction. Um, and that's all you need. It takes a little more 
finagling and you'll probably have a saw that starts to turn right off the bat. Um, the way you fix that is by stoning the saw, um, which is a little bit more in depth, but I have a whole video on that. It, it's really easy. You just take your, your, your plate and you put it on the side that it's turning towards and you uh, basically take a little bit of set out of all of them. Um, yeah, look up how to stone a saw. I don't like this idea. What? How to stone a saw. Oh, yes, yes. My initials There's are initials. S-A-W, if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the stony. She used to be sass. <laughs> she still is sass. <laughs> uh, let's see. Andy Morin asked, why are James's planes blue? And if it's paint, is it for rust protection or just to make them fancy? Yeah, um, the planes I have here, if they are blue, it is because I did a complete restoration on them. Um, they were um, past the point of no return. Um, now I'm going to start singing Thank that. Thank you, Phantom. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, um, and so whenever I strip a plane down that I'm going to use, I paint it blue. Um, because I like blue. Blue makes me happy. Um, so you like blue, blue planes and you cannot lie? Yeah. Um, I do have several videos on putting original Japaning on because uh, most old planes will be black and that's not because they painted them black. Uh, it's because they have Japaning on them, which is a, a different finish. It's, it's more like a lacquer um, and it's made with BLO, turpentine, and asphaltum. Um, and there's, there's actually a bunch of different recipes. Um, but I have a couple of videos on doing that as well. But yeah, if they're for my personal use in my shop and I strip something down, I paint it blue. So one of these days I'm getting a number one that needs to be restored and I'm painting it blue. Okay, I'll paint it pink first. No. Yeah, so I'll paint a teal one for you. Or uh, uh, teal. Yeah, that's the color we were trying to think of earlier. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? Um, Michael Green wants to know, will a draw bore work for a corner joint? Um... A corner joint so like in this joint um, yeah um, well if you're doing it for a corner joint um, you need to be careful in the orientation that you put it because um, sucking one joint in may push the other one out um, because the nice thing about doing it in the middle is you just have one movement if you have it on the corner not only do you have this movement but you also have this movement um, and so you need to be careful about putting that and so draw bore itself, um, unless it's a full enclosed tenon, in that case it works great. Um, but if it's something like a, uh, um, like a half lap or a uh, bridle joint, I don't think I would do a draw bore. I think I'd just regular pin it. And uh, if you're just going to pin something, the way you do is you put it together and you clamp it together. You lock it all down tight. You pull all the joints in where you want. And with it all clamped, then you drill your hole, put it in your peg, and then take the clamps off. Um, and that way you, you know it's all tight. The nice thing with the draw bore is you don't need a clamp because when this puts it in, it sucks it together and clamps it. Um, so it's kind of a fun way to do that. What's next? So have time for a couple more? Or do we have a couple more? Um, I think it's Rog of Woodworks asked, hey. um, can you use a center punch to set the saw without a saw set? Um, yeah, you can, but I wouldn't want to use... Um, something with it with a point. You don't want to dimple the tooth. Um, when you use a nail, it's it's soft enough so that it gets flattened. Um, so you get a, a flat spot that, that pushes the tooth. Um, so you want to be careful you don't actually dimple it. So yeah, Ragoff is the one who we sent all the, the tools to. So hopefully they make it to India someday. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love international shipping. All right, I'm caught up on questions. Is that it? Cool. I, I think that'll wrap it up. Uh, let's see, what do we have? Next week is, do we still have one more week in this month or is it June next month? Let's, it's June 1st next week. Ah, uh, June 1st next week, cool. Um, so. Did you talk about the MWTCA meet at the beginning of the show? I did not. Uh, for those of you, the MWTCA national meet is coming up, um, is that three weeks now? It's the 16th. Yeah, it's Two weeks from this week, weekend. No. It's the 16th. It's coming up. Yeah. Two or three weeks away. <laughs> um, and for those of you who don't know, the MWTCA, Midwest Tool Collectors Association, is the largest tool collecting club in the world. And twice a year, normally, they hold a national meet. 
Um, and this is the largest tool oh, sale gosh. in the world every time they hold it. It is mind boggling. Um, probably 50 to 60% of all my tools have come from MWTCA meets. And it is, it, it's phenomenal. So if you imagine an entire basketball court, full size basketball court, completely covered with tables, and every one of those tables is completely covered with tools for sale. And every one of those tables has buckets underneath them, completely full of tools for sale. Um, and it's pretty much everything. It is absolutely mind boggling. There are people who literally fly in from around the world. A little bit less of that this year for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, people come from around the world to the meet because it is, it's amazing. Um, and so I'm actually gonna be doing it. I'm really, really happy because it's only an hour away from me now, which says, Awesome. Usually I'm driving, you know, six, eight hours or more um, or flying to it. Um, so this is going to be very, very nice. So um, I'll be there. Um, my wife will be there, probably see the kids one day. Um, and we're going to be doing a uh, Wood by Wright meet, which I need to set up. It'll probably be on the Friday of that. Um, so yes, we're going to have lots of fun. So I'm hoping to see you there. And uh, if you are, let me know. And we'll be uh, talking about an upcoming meet meetup soon once I get that figured out. <laughs> cool, uh, anything else? Then let's uh, wrap this up. So I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, bye. You didn't say have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful day. Bye. <laughs>